Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation podcast. Join us and be inspired by the incredible stories of those who have faced cancer with strength and resilience and the medical professionals who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and ultimately a cure. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast brought to you by the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation. I'm your host, Mitch Stoller, Chief Philanthropic Officer at AACR. Today, we have an extraordinary episode lined up for you. We're joined by a truly remarkable individual whose commitment to cancer research and philanthropy has transformed countless lives. Rick Sontag, the president and founder of the Sontag Foundation and Brain Tumor Network, has been a beacon of hope and progress in the fight against brain tumors. Since 2002, the Sontag Foundation and Brain Tumor Network have invested over $100 million to advance research and provide critical support to patients and caregivers. Rick, it's an absolute honor to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to join our discussion. Welcome, Rick. Appreciate it. Great. Well, for our listeners who may not be that familiar with your journey, what inspired you to dedicate your efforts in the field of brain cancer? Well, it's not the kind of introduction to brain cancer that people want, but here's what happened. My wife, Susan, and I uh, had a company that we had bought and were running. It was uh, growing quite successfully until up around the uh, mid-1990s, early 1990s. At that time, uh, we had three children on their way to college. We were in the process of building a beautiful house uh, by the beach here in Jacksonville. And then one horrible night in June 1994, our world kind of collapsed. My wife, Susan, had a stroke. She uh, was suffering seizures and uh, having a number of other problems associated with it. Uh, We were lucky enough to be here in Jacksonville, Florida where there was a uh, campus of Mayo Clinic. We got her to Mayo Clinic to be diagnosed and she was diagnosed with having an anaplastic astrocytoma. That is a aggressive form of brain cancer. And I was told that she was going to have about three years to live. I was in a total panic as a result of that. And I searched everywhere to try to find something to do to help her at the time. Most treatments for brain tumors and brain cancer in general were poor, with poor outcomes. And so I was searching frantically for anything I could find to help her. I was in a total panic. I literally began uh, reading research papers uh, uh, issued by researchers in the brain tumor field. And I was calling uh, brain tumor researchers literally out of their research labs and asking them what they would do if they were in my position. I was lucky enough uh, to find an experimental protocol that happened to be run out of Mayo's uh, Rochester, Minnesota campus. It involved some pretty severe treatments, starting with three rounds of chemo, serially one after another, aggressive, nasty chemo agents, followed by a very large dose of uh, radiation to the head. It was a horrible uh, treatment. She had a tough time with the treatment, but by and gosh, uh, after about six months, the tumor began to shrink. Uh, In about two years, the tumor actually shrunk back to look more like scar tissue. And we had apparently cured the tumor. We had killed it. But Susan, my wife, was suffering from the effects of the uh, tumor itself, the stroke, and the horrible treatment that she got. And so I was uh, uh, in, a, in a position where I decided I would uh, one day uh, take a look at the rest of the people who get to go through this thing. And I said, one day I'm going to do something about this disease and the horrible effect that it has not only on the patient, but all the people around the patient who get affected by that cancer. And that's where I was headed and that's what I wanted to do. And lo and behold, In the year 2002, our company was approached by General Electric, one of our large customers. Uh, They wanted to purchase us, and 
we actually consummated that transaction in 2002. And after we consummated the transaction, I took part of the proceeds, as I said I would, and fulfilled that promise to myself. And I started the Sontag Foundation. And that's how we got into this business. Wow. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of people, you know, listening to this this episode and uh, are either just started their own foundations or maybe even interested in starting a foundation. Was that was that challenging to actually um, get a foundation off the ground, incorporate the foundation, et cetera? Well, the, the legal part of establishing the foundation was not difficult. That was fairly easy to do. The hard part was how do, you, how do you choose what to pick for a subject matter that you're going to, to deal with and what was your mission going to be in the foundation? And then recruiting all the people to do that over a period of time, that was really, that was the, that was the hard part of the experience. Finding your direction and finding a, a, a group of people who want to share that uh, dream that you had with the foundation and make it work. So yeah, it was a bit of difficulty, uh, but we got rolling uh, fairly uh, early. Uh, we actually got it off the ground and, and running and doing what we wanted to do within about the first uh, year and a half. Wow, that's great. Um, Rick, your foundation has been a beacon of hope for many. Please share with the audience the key programs of the Sontag Foundation and what accomplishments are you most proud of to date? Well, we started early on uh, deciding we're going to do something with research. We thought that that was the key to doing something about this disease. So we, we focused on research at the beginning. More specifically, we discovered through an, uh, a lot of marketing research we did that there was a gap in funding for young researchers who are just starting their, their career in brain cancer research. And so that became our focus. We decided we we're gonna pick uh, young people and fund them in their research and hope that they will be the people that turn out to be the ones that do something about this disease. Uh, we started small, uh, but we have grown that operation uh, of our foundation to where over the course of the last 23 years, we now have 69 grant award winners at 36 major uh, cancer centers around the United States. It has uh, turned out to be a much larger operation than we ever had envisioned. Uh, and we've been, we've been blessed to not only sponsor the uh, individuals doing the research, we've been able to put on events and associate ourselves with others in this community of uh, brain tumor research. Uh, events that we put on include a retreat that we hold once a year for our researchers uh, where they get together. We have about half science, about half pleasure in meeting each other. And we hope through that we get a lot of collaborations done among scientists who normally wouldn't be meeting each other except if we were under these circumstances. And, and by gosh, we've probably had 20 to 25 uh, cooperative research programs started as a result of our retreat. We also um, are major sponsors for uh, uh, organizations like the Society for Neuro-Oncology, where we've uh, teamed up with them to, uh, we have actually a sponsored lecture series there uh, with uh, Snow. We've, uh, uh, likewise, uh, had an association with ASCO, where we sponsored young scientists who are just at the beginning of their career. Uh, we've done the same with your organization, AACR, where we've uh, sponsored a young scientist at the beginning of, uh, of his career. And so, uh, over the years, uh, it's been fairly successful at all the things that we've done. And we've, we started from nothing back in 2002. And today, we are arguably uh, the largest uh, private funder of research related to brain tumor in, uh, in North America. And it's, it's been quite a ride, been quite a ride, but uh, we enjoy doing it. We're glad that we've been able to make uh, some real progress in the field in what we do. Well, that, that's fantastic. And, you know, as you know, um, here at ACR, um, you know, one of the, one of our very important missions is that next generation of cancer scientists. And so the work that you all are doing at Sontag is so, so important to be funding that next generation and, and to get people interested in, in brain cancer research and other varieties of cancer research. So um, I, I wholeheartedly uh, applaud your efforts in that regard. Um, you and Susan also decided to do something else for the field 
you decided to form a public charity, and that was the Brain Tumor Network, a direct patient and caregiver service, which is a service provided at no cost, at no cost to patients. So for our listeners, please tell us about the mission of the Brain Tumor Network. Early on, we decided that we wanted to do something for patients, and we started a support group right here in Northeast Florida where we live, and that support group has continued to this day, but what it did is it led into our learning more about the patient experience, and then over the years, we also found people from around the United States calling us because they know we're in the uh, funding of cancer research, and they've asked us for help in getting to places like clinical trials, second opinions, and the like. And in 2014 is when we started that public charity as a result of all this. We decided we had to do something more on a formalized basis and help people uh, that get into this horrible situation that I was in. And we started this uh, outfit called the Brain Tumor Network. And we started with one nurse navigator, uh, happened to be a clinical trials nurse out of Mayo Clinic here in Jacksonville, Florida. We have grown that operation substantially. Uh, we now have uh, 12 nurse navigators, three social workers, three medical records people, and a uh, staff support. And over the course of the last uh, uh, 10 years since it's a start, we've helped about 3,000 patients. And we help them find their way to clinical trials, second opinions, or just a reconfirmation of their diagnosis. We also help them with things like insurance problems, uh, finding their way for, uh, for treatment centers that maybe they're not aware of. And it's, it's become a great operation and a, a lot of fun for us to do. And we get a lot of satisfaction because that gives us the interaction with patients that are suffering from this horrible disease that my wife Susan went through. And could, so you, you said you started with one. Now, could, has this spread across different states and different areas of the country? Uh, yes. Actually, we, we have a system in Brain Tumor Network where we have an information system we developed ourselves. And so we can do it remotely from most locations. That is, we have the patient information. is all inputted into our IT system. We understand where all the treatment centers are and the treatment protocols going on. We have a direct connection to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the main uh, government website for all clinical trials. And so we get that information directly every night into our IT system. As a result, we are able to run operations independent from where we are here near Jacksonville, Florida. And we have six nurse navigators who are operating out of their home locations uh, across states, in, uh, mostly in the Eastern United States. And, uh, and so it's, it's an operation that can be done, not just right here in the home office, we can do it anywhere. And we are doing it and have done it. And all those uh, small offices at home are fully functional. We try to keep the team together by bringing them in once a quarter so we can work together as a team with learning experiences in terms of new information regarding uh, brain uh, cancer and its treatment. And, and so it's been, it's been quite a ride for us. And it's something we can expand further from where we are. It's that's it's amazing. Um, and, and Rick, is it is it hard to um, to find really good qualified nurse navigators? I know there are some you know fantastic patient navigation uh, e entities around the country that deal with lots of different uh, 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 navigation issues. But I'm just kind of curious how how you uh, I is that challenging to find you know the best navigators to to do this great work. It was at first as we got going, but interestingly, I would say probably three quarters of our nurse navigators that we've hired in the last ooh, five years have uh, come to us. They heard about our organization and what they do. They understand that some of them are navigators in their own medical system, you know, one institution, and they want to do something more generally for the population at large around the United States. And so we've actually had people call us. So at first it was a, it's a difficult, Mitch, but uh, these days it's a lot easier. And when we put out an all call for more nurse navigators, we are, uh, we are finding more nurse navigators that fit, meet our criteria. Of course, we're looking for, for people that have some experience in neuro uh, field 
but we have a number of people that start in general oncology, but it's, it's, it's taken off. That, that's pretty cool. And, and a follow-up question to that, um, you must get questions about other, the other, other types of cancers, I would imagine. And then um, you also must be getting questions globally. I, I wonder, are you, are you fielding questions from around the globe as well? Uh, yes, we are. And we do get questions about other cancers, but usually we can quickly refer them to an organization that is a little better prepared to help them with that. And we do get people from all around the world calling us and uh, emailing us and trying to make connections. And as a result of that, we have uh, gotten relationships uh, with organizations in probably most countries around the world. Certainly a good uh, 10 of them or so in major, major countries, and particularly ones that have more organized programs for brain tumor treatment. So yes, we do, and we don't do uh, as much probably today as we could in the future, but I would say we get a, we get a fair number of people asking us from uh, a variety of places around the world for help, and we refer them to the organizations that we've met. That's great, well done. Uh, Rick, it's incredible to hear about the work being done Collaboration and innovation are indeed critical in the fight against cancer. At the AACR, we're excited by the collaborative partnership that AACR and your organization, the Sontag Foundation and the Brain Tumor Network, have built over the past few years. Um, I, I know we're real excited about this partnership, but what excites you and, and your team about this partnership with AACR? I think one of the really neat things about this is that <clears throat> Often the people in the research side of the business don't get a lot of time to talk about the practical aspects of what they do. And so we, we found that our Operation Brain Tumor Network has been a really good way for, for people in the research lab to learn a little bit more about the patient experience. In fact, uh, at the last uh, uh, organization meeting that uh, AACR held in Minneapolis, it was related to brain tumors. And uh, we were able to give a presentation where we took uh, the people in the, in the group, probably about 150 people at least, in, at that meeting. And we had a, uh, a treatment a physician, uh, in fact, the chief of neurosurgery at uh, University of Minnesota. We had a patient uh, relative and myself, and we talked through the experience for being a patient of brain cancer, what it's like, what you can expect, and what it is from a patient perspective. And I think that was really educational for the people at AECR. And I, we hope to keep that kind of collaboration going where we can, we can take things that we've learned through our other experiences and be able to feed it to AECR and help their program benefit. That's great. Well, thank, really, really appreciate that from, from you guys. And, and I think you're right that I, I, we received a lot of great feedback from that particular meeting and for all, all that went down there. Um, Rick, um, what advice do you have for someone that may have recently been diagnosed with brain cancer? And, and not just the individual, I'm actually really interested also to hear your thoughts about uh, family, because I know you, know you and I've talked in the past and how important family uh, is a part of the um, of the cancer journey as well. But, but I guess it's really almost a two-part or what advice do you have for someone recently diagnosed with brain cancer and then you know the, the part that the family plays in that role as well? In the for what it's worth category, I was uh, my wife Susan's uh, caregiver. So I used to tell people here in uh, the office that I got my day job, which is the Foundation and Brain Tumor Network, and then I have my night job. And I was her uh, caregiver nights and weekends. So I learned a lot about the family experience. And then my children uh, and the rest of our family around us uh, got a good chance to be exposed to it. And it taught me a lot about what you have to do as a caregiver. So uh, I, I thought that, that's, a, that's certainly a good way to, to get into it. As far as if you're diagnosed, what I would suggest, uh, the first thing that we've discovered is a lot of times patients get rushed into doing something immediately. Uh, a lot of times there'll be some neurosurgeon saying, I've got to do surgery on you tomorrow, you know, or you're going to be in, in terrible shape. That usually isn't the case. Sometimes it is, in which case you have to do something immediately. But the first thing I would say is you have enough time 
think about it. Think about what you're going to do for a treatment. Explore your options. Think it through before you head down that road. Because often when you take one path on treatment, later on it may preclude you from something subsequently. The second thing I would say to patients is uh, go have a molecular profile done on that tumor. Uh, today it's more and more uh, used uh, that uh, there are molecular profiling done on tumor types that help uh, inform the kind of treatment. You can get it done almost anywhere in the United States by through, through independent laboratories. There are several large organizations that do it. Many of the big centers do it themselves. And I would say, um, be sure to try to see if you can get your uh, uh, local oncologist or your neuro-oncologist to get that profile done for you because it's going to inform the kind of treatment that may be successful for your case. And finally, I'd say, uh, don't panic. You know, I mean, it is easy to panic in this thing, but a lot of people have been through the same experience that uh, you've been through or go, about ready to go through. Uh, try to keep a cool head. If you are a patient, be sure you have somebody in the form of a caregiver around that you can take with you to appointments. Because a lot of times as a patient, you're a little bit caught up in other parts of the disease and a little bit more uh, frenetic. I would say take somebody with you who can listen to the oncologist and take notes on what to do and be able to help with the uh, options that are going to be available to, to you. So those are probably my three things. Um, I'm just want to follow back up on the caregiver side. Um, you know, I, I have tre tremendous admiration for for what 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 you do and what you have done. But uh, your kids, I, I, I they must have been um, it must have been a really tough time for them. And then you're 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 also their dad and. Um, uh, you know, that, that must, I mean, I'm just kind of curious how, how they uh, related to the experience of also being part of that family unit and being a caregiver to their mom. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a shock to all three of them. Um, I think they understood what the diagnosis was and what the prognosis was, but they had a hard time relating to it. Uh, they, they had a hard time adapting to what we had to do and to understand what kind of uh, expectations they would have to have after the treatment, particularly things like the nasty chemo agents where she was in terrible shape and where lost her hair and all that. I would say mm -hmm. it was a shock for the family, but you know what? In an interesting sort of way, it brought our family closer together. And I would say uh, one of the interesting experiences from this, when you go through it and probably uh, true for most cancer experiences is it often brings the family closer together and you have find people that you haven't communicated with uh, enough over time and somehow the unit uh, tends to form around it and it, you kind of form a, a group that's uh, battling as a group against this horrible disease. And I, we've discovered that with all the patients that we have in our support group. And I, usually when I have a new patient, I say, you're not going to believe this, but you're going to find that there's something very positive that's going to come out of this experience that you're not going to expect. And they don't know what I'm talking about at first, but boy, after a while, when they realize that the family kind of comes together to battle this disease, it's, it's, it's a group effort. And I think it's really something that, uh, that's very beneficial and it was beneficial for my family. You know, Rick, that's so true. I, uh, my brother um, is a cancer survivor, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma B cell. And, um, he wanted me to be with him. Uh, we're six and a half years difference. He's six and a half years older than I am. And, um, and he invited me to, he wanted me there for his first treatment, his first chemotherapy treatment. It was actually a, a cocktail treatment of rituxan and chemotherapy, which was at the time experimental. And uh, I, that experience um, <laughs> really did bring us closer together. Um, and, um, and then the, the, the rest of the family unit, obviously just, we, we kind of, uh, we kind of bonded around that and were, um, you know, we just felt like a, a, it was like a team, you know, a team approach to things. And so, um, your words are, uh, are very, very meaningful to me. Um, I think that's accurate. 
Rick, um, as I said earlier, um, I have a, a tremendous amount of admiration for uh, what you've done with the foundation, but you know, you've had a tremendous career as well. And I'm always interested uh, when I interview folks to learn a little bit about their uh, people that have, were their mentors um, and how their mentors perhaps um, uh, affected, you know, influenced their personal and professional growth. Would you mind sharing with, with our audience, um, in fact, uh, any mentors in your life and how they affected what you do and what you do today? Probably a lot of my mentorship was early on when I decided to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I had people in the venture capital business, particularly, who were uh, encouraging me to go do something. Uh, when we got started, uh, th there were several people in the venture capital business and several people in the legal field who kind of not only helped me along, but uh, kind of guided the thinking that I ought to have when it came to trying to be successful. And uh, I, I, I would say I took a lot of those words to heart. There, of course, were some, some bad experiences that happened along the way. I had a few failures. I uh, had things not go right at times. I mean, I literally got fired from the first three jobs that I had out of school. Uh, mm -hmm. Not summarily for, for bad behavior, but I just didn't fit. And right. it, all those, and the ability to come talk to people about what's next, coach, uh, was really helpful for me. And when I got on the track of being an entrepreneur and doing the thing where we, we wound up buying that small airplane parts company, it was uh, a number of people around me who helped encourage me and kept me going and, uh, and gave me some, some good ideas about the next step of my, of my career. So I would, I, would, I would credit a lot of that to the people that uh, advised me uh, not to, not to give up and uh, to keep on going. Have you taken some of those lessons into your nonprofit and philanthropic work as well? Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, I had a couple of people tell me that I, I am a nonprofit entrepreneur. I guess I never heard that one before, but it's exactly what we do. I mean, uh, the experience of running a nonprofit is just like running any other business. It is a business, in fact, and it's, it's businesses are built on people and people are important. And what you do with people, how you uh, make people interact with each other to make things happen, I think I've taken a lot of those experiences from that and used that in, in building out the nonprofits that, that I've, I've done. Uh, and I would just I to encourage anybody to have a little bit of business experience before you get into this, because then you understand the job of managing people, the job of being able to do analysis when it's time to do analysis, the, uh, the time when you, you got to put your heart into it, which a lot of these businesses, like the ones we have, uh, are, you need to do. And that's what you do when you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you, put, you give it your all. You know, you're in the business to succeed. And I think in our case for this nonprofit and our nonprofit in the, uh, the patient space, Brain Tumor Network, uh, it's the same thing. We, we try to use the same lessons that I had early on and I try to teach them to people about managing, how to manage people, how to interact with people and be good citizens in the things that we do. And hopefully I've been uh, successful at it. At least I think we got some pretty darn good people here. I think you've got some great people. And um, obviously those lessons have, have gone a long way to your, your great success. Um, and then one other question about inspiration. Um, what sources of inspiration do you turn to when you face challenges or need motivation in your own personal and professional life? Well, I have people that I look up to that you mentioned before. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I attend church regularly and have uh, for a long, long time. Uh, that certainly is an inspiration. And I think I... I spend a lot of time reading the stories of what other people have done with their lives and careers. And I think that helps uh, me stay on track and stay focused. Um, I've, I've had a couple of times where I've had people ask for advice when they've had failures. And I think to be able to do that and help other people that going through the same crummy experience that I went early in my career, I think all those things are very helpful for me and inspire me to keep on going. And I, I will just say this, People used to ask the same question of me back when my, my wife passed away about a year and a half ago, by the way. And people mm -hmm. used to ask me the same question. Well, what gives you the experience and motivation to keep doing this? And I said, well, it's pretty simple for me. 
I leave this office, I go home, I take one look at my wife, and that's about all I need to inspire me. So, right. And that is still keeping me going right now, the memory of her and what she did, because she went through a, a fight herself. She lived 28 years, believe it or not, post-diagnosis, but she mm -hmm. had some pretty rough experiences, particularly in the last of her life, and that inspires me to keep on doing more. You know, Rick, <laughs> every time I've, I've talked to you a, a number of times now, and uh, I always, always get in, enthusiastic and inspired by you, just just by your words and and how you go about things. It, and it, it 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 actually brings chills to me to want to go out and just continue to do better work and and continue to be impactful. Um, so so Rick, thank you so much for sharing your story and the impactful work of the Sontag Foundation and the Brain Tumor Network. How should listeners? Um, learn more about these great organizations? Uh, probably the easiest, Mitch, is to go online <clears throat> to our two websites. The one for the foundation is sontagfoundation.org, and the one for uh, the Brain Tumor Network is braintumornetwork.org. That's a good starting point because there we talk a lot about what we do and what we've done in the past, uh, and it gives you an idea of the things we're into. For example, we just started a new venture capital fund in the uh, foundation. It tells you a little bit about that. And it tells you about the people who are behind the organization and what their connection is to the disease. So that's a good starting point. Could you just spend a minute, if you would, uh, just telling us a little bit about the venture capital fund? Because I'm very intrigued by that. And I think our, our listeners would also be intrigued by that. We, we have something similar here at ACR called an Oncology Development Fund, which is also an investment fund. But I'd um, love to hear a little bit more about your fund as well. When I was an entrepreneur, I got funded by venture capitalists. So I mm -hmm. knew something about that business. And uh, in parallel with our starting the foundation, we kind of kept a, what I call a family office uh, here uh, where we had venture capital deals that we got into. So we were, we were fairly seasoned at the venture capital business over a period of time. It's, it's now a smaller part of what we do, but we, we got to know it quite well. And we've been approached a number of times uh, by researchers who said they have something that potentially could be clinically relevant and they'd like to turn it into a company. Uh, we uh, began a uh, giving some small grants in that field. And we said about three years ago, we need to be in this thing deep and we need to do it the right way. And in uh, foundations, the IRS allows you to do something called program related investing. And that is where you can put an investment in an organization. And uh, we have in our private foundation, which as you may know, is subject to IRA regulations, which says you got to give away 5% of your, of your assets every year. The mm -hmm. program related investment is allowed to take its investment and count it toward that 5%. And if it is successful, the whole uh, result goes back into the corpus of the foundation. And if it's a failure, it stays as part of a 5% contribution. So we got into it uh, using the IRS reg, a program related investment, but we, we decided to get in it deep and get in it broadly and we hired somebody out of a tech transfer office from one of the uh, major medical schools as the lead guy. And now we've expanded it. And uh, I'd say we probably looked, uh, Mitch, over the last uh, two and a half to three years at somewhere between, seriously, somewhere between 25 and 40 or 50 investments. We've only invested in about a half dozen of those to date. And that's probably typical for, for venture capital. Uh, but we've, we've now got a program that's, uh, that's broadening. In fact, we're in the process of hiring more people into that venture capital fund. And it's, it's a great success and it's a great way for us to take uh, some of the work that our scientists do, the ones that we funded, and who want to turn it into a real clinical uh, therapy to help them uh, turn it into a reality. That's amazing. So Rick, thank you once again for sharing your incredible journey and the impactful work being done through the Sontag Foundation and the Brain Tumor Network. Your dedication and commitment to advancing brain cancer research and providing vital support to patients and caregivers are truly inspiring. To our listeners, thank you for joining us on this episode of Believe in Progress podcast. If you want to learn more about the Sontag Foundation and the Brain Tumor Network or to get involved, please visit their websites at sontagfoundation.org 
and brain, braintumornetwork.org. These are links to those sites in the show notes for this episode. And remember, your support is crucial in the fight against cancer. Please consider making a donation to the American Association for Cancer Research at AACR.org, or it would help us to continue funding groundbreaking research and providing hope to cancer patients and their families. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode and share this podcast with friends and family to spread awareness. Together, we can drive progress and bring hope to countless lives. Rick, thank you so much for your time today. Um, look forward to seeing you. And again, thank you so much to your wonderful staff. Uh, they are wonderful professionals and really are making a great impact. Thank you, Mitch. It is a pleasure to be here with you.